Good afternoon, everybody. This is Greg Sweeney. Welcome to the conference call. Our topic today is the economy and the significant role that the consumer plays in the economy. And I think one of the things that has been most surprising to everybody is not what has happened in the economy, but what has not happened in the economy. And for the example, I'm using an old Sherlock Holmes mystery, the dog that didn't bark. This was the mystery of the Silver Blaze, the race horse that was stolen the night before, a big race. It, the horse was guarded by a guard dog, and the clue to the mystery was that the dog didn't bark. And the fact that the dog didn't bark meant that the horse was stolen by somebody that knew the dog. And the economy is a lot like that today. It's, uh, it's defined not by what happened in the economy, but what, what, what didn't happen. If we go back to last year, we're just in the wake of the Fed's first 75 basis point, Fed fund rate increase, Fed indicated there would be more. Uh, the market forecasters were saying that we would start to go into a recession, unemployment would go up, earnings would go down, corporate earnings would be under pressure, and, um, and the economy would be wrecked, right, essentially. Uh, but none of that's happened. So to take a closer look as, as to why that hasn't happened, Let's take a look at employment, which is a big economic driver in the United States. Employment is what gives consumers income, and that income to consumers is what makes up about 70% of our economy in the United States. There are about 161 million people working in the United States today, and that provides the basis for most of the income that, that goes into the U.S. economy. Um, if we look at the next page, uh, unemployment rate is down to historical lows. Uh, Long-term average unemployment rate somewhere around four and a half, four and three quarters percent. We're currently below four percent, or uh, yeah, four percent. Excuse me, four million unemployed people as well. Um, people are looking for work. These are these are people who are formally looking for work, but not able to find it. So towards the low end of the 22-year history that we that we see here. For various reasons, you know, people might not be able to find work. Maybe they're in the wrong geographic location in the United States. Maybe they have the wrong skill set or education or experience. But the fact of the matter still is there's only there's less than 4 million people unemployed. But if we look at the job openings, we see that there's about 10 million job openings. So there's about two and a half jobs open for everyone that is currently unemployed. Um, the number suggests that, um, well, I, I, excuse me, that I should also note that uh, in addition to the, the job openings, what we're also seeing is there are a number of people who are no longer quitting. So there is some softening in the job market, as we can tell by the number of people quitting and leaving for other jobs has, has been reduced. One of the ways that we could fill the remaining 10 million open positions, um, you know, recognizing there's only 4 million unemployed people, is to continue to um, uh, enhance the what we call the labor force participation rate. These, this is the percentage of people who are eligible to work, but for whatever reason are not working. Uh, typically, it's people between the ages of 18 and, and 65. Um, obviously, not every one of them has worked. You can see the history here. We started a high of about 67% of the, of the uh, eligible workforce with jobs back in 2000. Uh, for the most part, that it had been trending lower all the way up to the point prior to the pandemic, which, at which point it started to drift a little higher. Uh, of course, it dropped during the pandemic when the economy uh, significantly slowed down or you know, some, some uh, media outlets use the word close the economy. And, and since then, it's dri drifted back up to about 62.5%, still a little short of where it was, around 63.5%. That might not sound like much, but when there's you know 200 million eligible uh, people to work in the United States, that 1% that is about 2 million people. So it would go a long ways to closing that uh, gap between the number of job openings and the number of unemployed people in the United States. Incomes. Uh, remember, I mentioned that the consumer is about 70% of the total economy. If we measure the consumer income, the change in consumer income from the beginning of 2019 until now, we can see it's gone up by about $10,000 on average. Disposable personal income has gone up about $10,000 on average. 
But a lot of that was just covering for the rise in inflation that occurred. If we look at the blue line, that is the real change in personal income. So that's after adjusting for inflation. That's up only about $1,000, $2,000, I guess, from, from the beginning of 2019. So a lot of the increase in purchasing that we've seen is pricing, price increase, increase in prices, but not increase in real disposable income, uh, much, much lower increase. Those spikes that you see there, you might be wondering what those are. Um, normally, people's incomes do not uh, fluctuate that much, but those are the stimulus packages that came out in the wake of the pandemic, um, those, those stimulus checks that came out. So it gives you some idea of what's going on there. Uh, we see the same numbers reflected in overall consumption in the United States. If we look at nominal consumption, you can see that's gone up over $18 trillion from, from about $11 trillion at the beginning of January, so roughly 10 years ago. If we look at the red line, that's real after inflation adjusted personal consumption, uh, a much more normal looking trend line in, in the absence, of course, of the of the big dip during the pandemic. But you can see most of the increase in personal consumption when you compare the difference between the red line and the blue line has been inflation. So inflation has had an outsized impact over the last couple of years, as you can see by that growing gap uh, and, and, and the um, short duration of that growing gap in the personal consumption measurement. Overall, it, the consumer feels real good. Uh, there are surveys out there that, that rank consumer confidence, and you can see consumer confidence dip to the low 90s, high 80s, if you will, in, during the pandemic, but has since recovered to about 110. If we look at that historically, we see consumer confidence is at the high end of, uh, of, of its range. So the consumer is feeling good because they have jobs, they have income, um, and, and uh, apparently are are satisfied you know overall with the with the economy but i'm i'm asking the question is there something else we should be looking at is there more to this story and this is where i think that that um, um there's some underlying cross currents that are important to to focus on first of all how has the consumer kept up with the inflationary environment remember we saw in real terms that their income hadn't gone up very much uh, since the beginning of 2019 on previous slides. One of the ways the consumer is trying to pay all their bills is they're tapping into savings. Now, savings went up materially during the pandemic for two reasons. One, the stimulus checks that went out, and two, a lot of businesses were closed, so there wasn't any uh, places for the consumer to spend their money. Um, since that time, though, as the economy has started to speed up again, uh, uh, consumers have gone in, tapped all those additional savings, uh, when, and we've gone from uh, uh, overall average savings of about $1.5 trillion to um, total savings by, by the consumers of less than a trillion dollars. So it's even below the average. So part of the way the consumer has kept up with these rising uh, inflationary environment costs is to tap into savings. The other thing they've done is they've reduced their overall savings rate. So historically, the consumer saves about 7% of their income in, in the form of savings. Uh, again, you see the spikes up during the pandemic when, when the economy was relatively shut down and no place to spend it. You see it spike, spiking up in terms of the percentage of their income that they're saving. But now we're down to about four and a half percent, which is below its long-term average. So this is another area where the consumer is capturing a little bit of more spending power today. They're not saving as much of their income as they, as they used to. Both of these last two slides indicate that the consumer might not be as strong as they were in some of those earlier slides that we saw. And finally, the other thing the consumer is doing is taking on more debt. If you recall, if you've been around long enough to remember the great financial crisis of uh, 08, 09, one of the challenges at the time was excessive debt levels. Well, if, if, if excessive debt levels were a problem then, they're more of a problem today. Now, the benefit, of course, is uh, a lot of the debt that we see happening, you know, basically we see debt going up again starting in about 2016, is to the extent that that debt is fixed debt, uh, in other words, mortgage debt, maybe 30-year mortgage debt, uh, it's, it's, low, it's, it's debt at lower interest rates than we'd seen probably prior to that. But the consumer, uh, nonetheless, has taken on 
you know, roughly $5 trillion more in debt than they had in 2008. So that is the other way, the third way, the third leg, if you will, where consumers are finding resources to keep up with the inflationary environment today. So even though they've reported that they feel good about the economy with consumer confidence being, being pretty solid compared to historical averages, there, there are some concerns in the ability of the consumer to continue to to consume and to feel good about what's going on again because they've tapped their savings they've reduced their savings amount and they've added and they've added debt um some more some other tidbits that that uh, we've been seeing uh in terms of the consumer is that surveys that that are done by various um, federal bodies one of them says that fit, uh, it responded to a survey said 57 percent of the people are not able to meet a thousand dollar unexpected expense. Furthermore, forty percent are not able to meet a four hundred dollar expense. Right, and I think that that we saw that on earlier graphs where savings rates went down and savings amounts went down. Right, puts more and more people um, at, at the margin in terms of being able to meet unexpected expenses. Um, we're seeing more recent data come out that suggests that more people are getting turned down for loans. Matter of fact, on the auto financing area, um, more people are being turned down than are being than, than had had been applying for loans. So we we see a combination of maybe weakening consumer credit fundamentals as a reason for for um, more auto loans being turned down, or potentially tighter bank underwriting credit standards. So it could be a combination of a couple of things there. But the fact of the matter is, is the consumer looks like they're, they're at least um, early stages of, of being more confined in terms of their ability to continue to expand their consumption. We talk about, uh, we start by, out by saying, you know, when the Fed increased interest rates, everyone was talking about the prospect of a recession. Uh, one of the indicators of a recession are what we call a yield curve inversion. A yield curve inversion is where short-term interest rates are higher than long-term interest rates. So to the extent that, that short-term interest rates go higher, it's the Fed trying to slow down the economy. To the extent that longer-term interest rates remain low, it's the bond market, longer-term bond investors saying, you know, the uh, we're satisfied with those longer-term yields being below short-term yields uh, for, for maybe a, uh, a couple of reasons. One, uh, investors want the protection from fixed income securities in the in the in in a declining economic environment. So that would be a, a recession. The other reason people own long term securities at lower rates is they see the long term inflation rate um, going back to maybe a level below where it is right now, and and they're they're happy with the lower longer term yields. In in either case. Yield curve inversion has a 100% accuracy in terms of predicting a forthcoming recession. Uh, the, the gray line on there it all uh, represent economic recessions and all the red lines in there are periods where the yield curve inverted or uh, short rates were higher than long-term rates. If you look at where we are today, you can see that the yield curve inversion is, is inversion is one of the more severe inversions. Now, we already are having people saying this time is different. Um, I'm sure there were some people that said this time is different in all these previous periods that you see on the screen here back to 1970. Um, maybe it is, and maybe we avoid a recession, but historically speaking, that has not been the case. So you might be asking yourself at this point, well, if the inverted yield curve leads to a recession, how can we haven't seen a recession yet? And um, to this next page that we see here gives us a historical average between the time that the yield curve becomes inverted and the time which the recession comes on. Uh, at, its, at its shortest point, the, um, it's been 140 days later. Um, on average though, the the um, the recession starts about a year later, 311 days, and uh, it can be as long as 487 days. So the yield curve became inverted on on um, November 22nd last year, and so far no recession yet. Um, but but on average we wouldn't expect a recession yet because on average a recession takes 311 days to get here. 
could be as long as, you know, almost the middle of 2024. Of course, that assumes that that 100% predictability remains in place. But going coming full circle from the way I started, I think some of the strength in the economy and the stock market right now comes from the fact that the economy that the recession hasn't happened, as opposed to uh, what was what was the primary thinking in time uh, at, at this time last year. Just for uh, argument's sake, of course, forecasts have two potential outcomes: lucky or wrong. But this is what the latest GDP forecasts are. We can see that uh, forecasts as a whole start to show the economy going into a recession during the third quarter of this year, remaining uh, growth, remaining challenged into the fourth quarter of this year. And first quarter next year, we come out of the recession with a small uh, growth of about three quarters of a percent. Um, I, I'm gonna say it's this, maybe these forecasts are jumping the gun a little bit. Uh, again, it's always hard to tell. But uh, I suspect third quarter GDP probably remains positive, maybe even fourth quarter, and we and we push the slowdown into into um, late fourth quarter, maybe first quarter 2000 and, and, and 24. Again, to the extent it's correct, uh, this time could be different, um, but you know nobody knows. Uh, there's also another. There's a, a number of things that are outstanding that that could deteriorate and reflect in the economy and economic conditions and employment for that matter. One of them is commercial real estate, uh, various types of commercial real estate, uh, multi-tenant commercial real estate in particular is challenged, particularly in, in uh, urban um, um, city centers. Uh, of course, as I mentioned earlier, we're seeing probably tighter credit and liquidity constraints in the, in the banking sector. We still have in the background the potential Chinese and Taiwan conflict. For those of you that follow the, the stock market, we're seeing significantly elevated value, uh, valuations in terms of PE ratios. Matter of fact, um, the equity market falls into the category of what I call the Magnificent Seven. It's the seven largest companies in the S&P 500 that have dominated the returns this year, that being Amazon, Netflix, Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Meta, and Tesla. Uh, if I missed one in there, I apologize for it. But the, the vast majority of the returns, about three quarters of the returns come from those seven companies. The other 493 uh, on the S&P 500 make up the difference. As, it, as we're speaking today, the total return year to date on the S&P 500 is about 20%. So 15% essentially came from that magnificent seven with the remaining 5% coming from all the rest. Um, if we go into an economic slowdown, of course, corporate earnings are pressured. And if corporate earnings are pressured at a time when, when uh, valuations are high, we could see some excessive sell-off potentially in the equity market. Um, do we get a deeper recession than what's expected? As I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of forecasters who already thought we'd be in a recession. So um, it's hard to say what that expected uh, trough might be. But as you recall from the last page, uh, it was not a significant recession in terms of reduction in economic activity. Um, and, then, and then the question is a lot of people also, a lot of Institutional investors sh probably shorted the market going into last year, and then with the surprise of, of, of nothing happening or nothing bad happening, and the and the economy rally rallying or the um, stock market rallying, we probably saw some some short covering, which means that uh, people who had shorted stocks uh, covered those shorts by buying those stocks back in the open market. So the 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 uh, the remaining question is at this point is how does an investor move through all of this, right? I mean, I mean it's always great if you can buy at the bottom and sell at the top, but that really never has been a winning investment strategy. Uh, the bigger winning investment strategies are to be greedy when other people are fearful, and be fearful when everyone else is greedy. And I would say that given what's happened so far in the equity market this year. There's probably a little bit of excessive greed. So as an investor, it's time to be a little bit fearful. Um, and, and the best way to move through economic environments of all types and accurately uh, realizing your overall investment management goals is to continue to be disciplined by routinely um, you know, investing in the markets, not being 
overly aggressive or overly conservative um, and to focus on the long term. As much as we would love to buy low and sell high, it, again, it's just not a successful investment approach. So that's what I have for you all today. Hope you enjoyed the conference call. Thank you for your business. Wishing you a great day.